Good morning, church. Yesterday, my, uh, my son Foster, who was up here a second ago for the blessing, played in the championship Little League game, and we lost 23 to 22. It was a real defensive showdown. That was a baseball score, as you can tell. Anyways, I was yelling so much yesterday, and I woke up today a little bit hoarse today, but I promise you I was not yelling as much as Lindsay was uh, yesterday at that game. She was into it. All right, hey. We are in Genesis 28 this morning. If you want to go there, you can. We're continuing our series on building the next generation, looking at the, the, the handoffs of faith that take place in Genesis. While you're going there, let me tell you a story. Seeing these kids up here, start a summer work camp starting this week, gets me thinking back to my camp days back in the summer growing up. I went to Mountain Fork Christian Camp in Beavers Bend, Oklahoma. And uh, in the middle of the day, we went to swim in this river that ran through the state park there. The, the river was icy cold. They drew it from the bottom of this really deep lake and then um, from the dam at the end of that lake, and then it ran throughout the, the park. And we would go there in the middle of the day when it was so hot, and we would swim in that icy cold water. But I, I, you know, I want to assure you, boys and girls never swam together. That was the number one rule of Mountain Fort Christian Camp, no mixed bathing. And I, I know why that was the rule. It's because we called it mixed bathing instead of mixed swimming. I mean, nobody's out there lathering up. Mixed bathing sounds scandalous. <laughs> Taking baths? With, yeah, that sounds scandalous. So that's why we didn't do that. Don't worry. Um, but I do have this vivid memory of the last night of camp. And it's late. It's after the worship and hugging and crying each other as we're thinking about leaving the next day. And then... Several of the folks there at camp are ready to give their lives to Jesus in baptism. There's no baptistry at the camp, so we all go down to the river. And it's dark outside, and there's no lights at the river. So I remember we, all those church buses without air conditioners uh, pull up next to the river, and they all shine their headlights on the water. I remember that. And there's this fog coming off the water, and then we all wade out there around our friends. And it was magical because there was boys and girls in the water together. And we go out there into the water, and I can remember my friends just one after another giving their lives to Jesus in baptism and coming up out of that water and us singing around them. As I remember that, I'm just filled with this just feeling that's kind of hard to describe. I, I remember that just being filled with awe for this God. I remember we loaded up in those church buses and we drove back listening to Mercy Me's I Can Only Imagine. You remember that song? I can only imagine about what heaven's going to be like and thinking about my friends who are going to be there with me, with God, and just being filled with delight in the Lord. As I think about that experience and I try to categorize that feeling, I think I would put it in the same category as the feeling I had early one morning climbing this mountain in New Mexico with my dad. And we left early when it was still dark and we get high up on that mountain near the saddle just below the summit of this mountain, right about the time the sun peeks over the mountains surrounding us and just bathes every peak around us and every valley with light and just being overcome with the splendor of what I was seeing. And this is amazing. And as I think about that feeling, I would also place that in the same category as the feeling I feel when something I have prayed for really deeply, something that perhaps the whole church is praying for together when God answers that prayer. You know those feelings, like something you were praying for almost beyond hope, and then God does it. There's a, a brother here at Highland who's been dealing with really bad eyesight issues the last few years. And so many of us have been praying for him. And the other day, he had a breakthrough and has seen better than he has seen in years. I'm just awed by God. And so as I try to figure out exactly what that feeling is that all three of those stories inspire in me, I think that's the right word. The feeling is awe just being amazed by the glory and the power and the nature of, of this God of ours. Awe. All right, come with me to Genesis 28. This is a story of awe. Let me show you this. We're picking up with Jacob. This is Isaac's 
son. We're going to skip the Jacob and Esau stories. We're going to come back to those later and do them together. So I'm skipping them right now. We looked at Abraham. We looked at Isaac last week. Now we're on Jacob. We're in Genesis 28, verse 10. Let's read this. Jacob left Beersheba and he set out for Haran. And when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking out the stones there, he put it under his head and he lay down to sleep. And he had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And then above it stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. And I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. And you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you, and I will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. What a promise. Let's keep reading. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid were filled with awe. And he said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And early the next morning, Jacob took that stone he placed under his head and he set it up as a pillar and he poured oil on top of it. And he called that place Bethel, which means house of God. And though the city used to be called Luz. And then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I'll give you a tenth. He says. Let's be really clear. Before this dream, Jacob is the worst. He's the worst. He has zero redeeming qualities. In Genesis 25, we haven't looked at this yet, we will in a couple weeks, but in Genesis 25, Jacob steals his older brother Esau's birthright with a pot of chili. And then in Genesis 27, he lies to his old blind father, tricks his old blind dad so that he can steal his older brother's blessing from his dad. And then you know what he does? He runs away from the consequences. He runs away. Okay, he's in the middle of running when we come across this story in Genesis 20. He is the worst kind of person. I've tried to picture like a modern day equivalent of Jacob, and here's what I've come up with. Jacob is like the guy whose parents, the teenager whose parents, give him a car on his birthday, and he crashes it. And then they send him to a rich, very expensive private Christian college, and he fails out of it. And then he comes home and he's sleeping on the couch at his parents' house. And his mom's one request is that he would get up for her on Mother's Day and come to church and he sleeps through it. And then he runs up the debt on his parents' credit card. And when they finally get the nerve to confront him about his behavior, he's on his phone the whole time. Okay, none of that's in the text. Um, That's how I picture him. And some of you know that guy. Some of you, he's on your couch right now. (laughs) You know him. Now, here's the thing. His father, Isaac, has great faith at this point. Great faith. Faith like his father, Abraham, had. In fact, if you read the beginning of Genesis 28, verses 3 to 5, Isaac speaks his faith and a blessing over his son, Jacob. But Jacob leaves And that faith is not his. This generational faith handoff has not happened. He is the worst at this point. But he finds himself at this place that is really special to his family. This place called Bethel. Now what we know about Bethel is back in Genesis 12, Bethel is the place where Abraham apparently went when he entered the promised land for the first time. And Abraham goes into Bethel, and he realizes this is a sacred place. And so he cries out to God at Bethel. So Bethel is a place where Abraham went to pray, 
and where his grandson goes to sleep. I mean, that's a sermon right there. The place where his grandpa went to pray, Jacob goes to sleep. But fortunately, he's at the right place for this nap because he has this dream that's more than he bargained for. Uh, one scholar said that, that Jacob finds himself at the axis mundi of the world. Now, when we think about that term, we think about the axis that the world spins on, but it's actually an ancient word that means the place where heaven and earth come together, a thin place is what Celtic Christians would call it, a place where God is, is really close. And so he's scared. And he's scared for good reason. Because he's stolen from his brother, he's lied to his dad, and now the God that his dad talks about all the time, the God that his dad has given his whole life to, and the God that his dad is frankly afraid of, has found him in this thin place. So he has every reason to be terrified. But instead of smiting him, instead of killing him, instead of cursing him, you know what this God does? He blesses him. Speaks the same blessing over Jacob that he spoke over his grandpa Abraham, that he spoke over his dad Isaac. This God that has every reason to wipe him off the face of the earth because he's the worst. Instead, that God finds him and blesses him. And it's that experience of receiving what he did not expect from the God he did not expect to encounter that leads him to say this. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid, and he said, how awesome is this place. Now that word afraid actually means filled with awe. He was afraid, and he said, how awesome, same word, is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. I like how Everett Fox translates it because he captures what the word actually means. He says, he was awestruck. And he said, how awe-inspiring is this place. This place is overflowing with that feeling I was describing at the beginning of just being amazed by the glory and the might of God. And it changes Jacob's whole life. He was looking for sleep. He ends up getting a lot more than he bargained for. I want to come back to that in a second. I'm preparing for a series we're going to do in the fall out of the book of Acts. And if you've ever read in the book of Acts, this is the story of the early church. You'll remember Acts 2. It's the story of when God pours out his spirit on the the people of God, the first disciples of Jesus Christ. It's an incredible story, and you may remember that that story ends in Acts 2 with the description of the early church as they're together, they're devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And you remember what it says about them? Everyone was filled with awe for God. And because of that feeling, what they do is incredible. They share all their stuff, they sell all their possessions, and they share with anybody who has need. The community around them is amazed by them. The community around them isn't hostile to the church. They're amazed by the church, and thousands of people begin pouring in and being baptized into Christ Jesus. Why? Because they see this group of people who are filled with something they don't even know how to describe. All for God. ACU, Avalon Christian, where I went to school, has this statue that's called Jacob's Dream. And it's an artistic rendering of this story in Genesis 28 when Jacob wakes from a dream to see angels um, ascending and descending from heaven, and he sees the Lord at the top of this ladder. And so this statue was put up at ACU, and uh, there's a little video clip of it. I want you to see it and just kind of capture this visually, this scene. And what I want you to pay attention to is the baptistry at the bottom of the statue. Let's watch this little clip.
I showed Russ that video, and he's like, man, that's incredible. And I said, yeah, you should have gone to ACU. It's just normal there. No. I worked grounds crew uh, several summers at ACU, and it was, you know, it was West Texas, so we get up to 100 degrees during the day. So we would start really early in the morning before the sun came up. And I would sneak away on the gators. They let us drive around campus every morning, and I would pull up to this tree behind Jacob's Stream, and I would see the sun rise from the east on that Jacob's Stream statue. And I remember that feeling of just awe as I imagined that. Seeing angels descending and ascending from heaven, seeing the Lord at the top of that statue. And I think my favorite thing about that statue is the baptistry at the bottom. And seeing countless college students over the years who were baptized under that statue of angels going down and up from heaven. I think the point is really clear with the location of that baptistry below that statue, right? Is that when we are filled with awe, For God, it changes our lives. And this is why Romans tells us that God designed a world to make his eternal power and divine nature known to us. That's Romans 1.20. So think about what he's saying. God designed a world that would show us his power and nature. Why? So that in seeing that and experiencing that, we would come to be filled with the awe we were designed to feel. We were hardwired for all. We were hardwired to be amazed, to be enraptured, to be undone. But we walk around, honestly, with blinders on, don't we? Paul Tripp talks about it like this. He says, some of us suffer from the worst kind of blindness. He says, it's the physical ability to see without the spiritual ability to really see what you've seen. It's the capacity to look at wonders, things specifically designed to move you and to produce in you breathless amazement and to not be moved by them anymore. He says it's the sad state of yawning in the face of glory. Think about that. Hmm. There's a young man here. He's um, late 20s, early 30s single young man, but there was a couple here at Highland who he was really close to, and they were expecting their first child. And so he he was real close to them. He'd go have dinner with them all the time, hang out with them. And so he had been just praying for nine months for the arrival of this baby girl. He was so excited about this. He felt like an honorary uncle to this little baby girl. And so they have that baby at the hospital. He goes up there, and he's on his way into the hospital, and he realizes he has never held a baby in his life. He walks into that hospital room, and before he knows it, they stick that girl into his arms. And he says he's holding this baby in his hand, and he just started to weep. He was just undone by the miracle of this little baby girl. And what's he feeling? Awe. Awe. We experience what God designed us to experience. It changes us. Now, look at the story of Jacob. Look what what happens to him. Before this, remember, he was the worst. But after this experience of encountering God and being overcome with awe, we read this. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I'm taking, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I've set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I'll give you a tenth. Okay, again, this was a guy who was the worst, who was running from all the bad things he had done, running from God, who after this one experience of encountering the Lord, devotes his whole life to him and even promises he's going to tithe. Can I get an amen? Can I get an amen? Yeah, you can amen that. Some of you aren't tithing. (laughs) Changes his whole life. Changes his whole life, right? Okay, let me ask you this. Why do you think so many of our young people are going to be baptized at Camp Highland in a couple of weeks? Why are so many of them going to be baptized there? Okay, some of them is because they followed my camp policy, which was shower as little as you can. And so they need that. But the reason that most are going to be baptized there is that they believe like Jacob, the Lord is in this place. And they're going to experience the Lord that week in ways they did not think were possible. When they experience that, what they're filled with is awe. 
this is an amazing God. And when you feel that, you can't stop yourself from giving yourself to Him and devoting your life to Him. That's why they're going to surrender themselves to Him. So let me ask you this. Don't we want that to be the case here in this place? Don't we want this place to be a place where anytime somebody comes through those doors, they leave believing the Lord was in that place. And they give themselves to Him because of it. I got an email from Linda Bateman. She was a longtime Highland member. She's moved away. She lives out of town now, but she was sick a couple weeks ago. This was on our Life Giving Sunday when we uh, gave away money to Hope Works to build a transitional living facility for those coming out of incarceration, when we celebrated medicine sent to Jab's son in Papua New Guinea, who's doing so much better, by the way. When we talked about our work in Ukraine, when we baptized a young woman behind me, so it was a big day. And she happened to tune in on our live stream. And I got an email like 11 uh, 22, so right after service from Miss Linda, and this is what she said. She said, wow, I've never been so grateful for a sick headache. It gave me an opportunity to live stream with Highland this morning, a church at work, a church serving all corners of the earth, serving in ways that are vital, partnering with the war-torn and weary, supplying a distant country with devastating illness, bringing encouragement to families and doctors, providing practical and safe living quarters for those still needing a leg up sharing in a mother's answered prayers for her daughter. And I know firsthand the support and encouragement Highland has been to the mission of Timothy Hill. Highland continues to be in the trenches. My love and prayers will be with all of you as you continue with what God places before you. In him, Linda Bateman, parentheses, totally forgot about my headache. That's all. What we're supposed to be is a mirror that reflects God's glory to the world. When someone comes here, and especially I'm thinking about our young people, when our young people come here and are filled with all life-changing awe for God, that's when we're doing what we're supposed to do. And let me point out, it's so special that the place where Jacob experiences this is the same place his grandpa did. And this place, Bethel, was a multi- generational, awe-inspiring place of God. That's what we want to be. But I'll tell you, the story doesn't actually end that well for Bethel. In 2 Kings 12, this is years later, Bethel is the place where King Jeroboam puts two golden calves and the people begin to worship something not God. It becomes the center of idolatry. What he recognizes is that his people are made for awe, and he's trying to redirect their awe to something they were not made to be in awe for. How tragic is that? This place that's a multi-generational, awe-inspiring place of God becomes the center for idolatry. I was reading a story. This was in a cycling article. The article, the picture was of this old white New England church. Like think Norman Rockwell, New England, uh, Rolling Green Hills, Red Barn in the background. And it was in a a bike website I was looking at. And so I checked out the article. I clicked on it. And what it was, was about a race that was stationed there at that church. I was so excited about this. I was thinking about all the races we could host for cyclists in the area. turns out, though, it's not a church anymore. This This is what they said. Now, after many months of planning and learning and demo and construction, they have officially opened the doors to Dirt Church Brewing Company, the only brewery in Essex County in northeastern Vermont. What a victory, right? This church built in 1857 that closed down is now the place where you can get a beer after a hard ride. Wow, what a victory. Now, what a tragedy. This place that inspired awe for generations is no more. I mean, think about it with me. What if Highland, years from now, it's hard to imagine this. And God's doing such amazing things here right now. What, imagine this with me. Though. What if years from now, this was the Houston Levy office park where you could rent space for your business and we came and we worshiped money here. Or what if this was the uh, Houston Levy Levy, uh, storage facility and we competed with our neighbors down the street who've got a monopoly over here? 
And we offered, you know, heating and cooled storage here. And this was the place where you could worship all the stuff you've acquired and can't get rid of. What if that was the case here? It's hard to wrap your mind around that, and yet it's possible. I mean, we talked about this. Nine churches of Christ each month are closing down. Think about the loss to the kingdom that that is. These places that for generations have inspired above all awe and God are closed down, demolished, turned into an office. Can you imagine that? Our deep desire, and this is what's inspiring this vision for 2028 of building up the next generation, is that this place be a place that continues to build all and all those who would come here for generations and generations. That is what we are supposed to do. That's our calling. And we believe God's given it to us. Would you join me in prayer as we finish? God, my prayer this morning is that every person here has encountered you today. They leave here whispering to each other at lunch, the Lord was in that place. God, I pray that you would fill every person here with awe for you. That they would be undone, amazed by your glory and your honor, power and your nature. You, the God who finds us when we're at our worst, instead of condemning us, blesses us. A God of sweet, abundant grace. How awesome you are. And God, I want to join with these people in this room this morning, praying specifically for those young people we saw on the stage this morning. For the high schoolers who are starting work camp this week and go to camp later in the year, middle schoolers, for those young adults and those college-age students who are home for the summer. God, our prayer is that here they would know you are an amazing God worth giving their whole lives to. And that as they consider that God, that they would be filled with life-changing awe. We pray this, God, in the confidence and hope we have in your Son, Jesus Christ. As we consider what He has done for us, which is so far beyond compare, God, our only response is declare, to declare that you are awesome indeed. And we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.